something that, that we all will need from each other in this session. Listening, acceptance. Um, can people relate to that? Yeah? Does anybody have uh, another uh, way of saying that or a different perspective on how we can connect with other people? Um, no judgment zone? No judgment zone. Okay, very nice. Uh, I think we can all relate with that. And, and what, would, what would we need by no judgment? Um, active listening, like she mentioned. And, um, yeah. Anybody else? Active listening? Yeah. Uh, confidentiality. <coughs> very big one. So, confidentiality is included in sort of that, that general theme of non judgmental. So, yeah, so the, the stories sharing in the space in this session today are necessarily going to be a discussion um, at the dinner table. Right? If I'm sort of explaining a personal experience of my own life, um, that those sort of statements in this room. Very good, thank you. I think we would all agree with that. Um, so really I'm going to wrap up right here and to say that one of these, this activity uh, can help build guidelines for group therapy um, where we're all sort of co-creating a language about what guidelines really mean to each other, um, and co-creating a space and an understanding of what it does mean to feel safe in the space. So thank you, welcome. I hope you all feel safe here um, for our presentation. Okay, so from the Toronto to Trust Clinic, we can talk. Art therapy, art therapy, and art therapy. Um, our clinic also offers multimodal groups, psychotherapy groups, and the clinic is fully accessible and services are free of charge. Um, just a quick note on accessibility. We've really quite a bit on accessibility um, for today, but accessibility means more than just making sure that the doors are large enough or that there's ramps. Um, so that's a culture I think we're not play. Accessibility can be um, who's on the other end of the phone? Um, are they patient? Are they supporting people? Uh, the type of documents that we require when people are coming into the clinic. So everything needs to be accessible, not, not just physical structure. I know that that's where we go to automatize it's physical structure accessibility, but we also need to think about um, other items. Now, um, the, the research project that one of the So our, our clinic is comprised of our director, Dave Hainsborough, um, some of you might be familiar with him, our associate director, Chanel, and we have uh, April Wana as our advocacy and outreach worker, and John Levi uh, as our senior advocacy and outreach worker. And the three clinicians are again myself, Virginia, and Amanda. So how does our story begin? The 
marginalization of people with intellectual disabilities was made physical with the building of institutions to house hundreds and thousands of people. Within the walls, people with disabilities were often raped and brutalized. Many died without even having the slightest hope of freedom or even an end to the abuse at the hands of their caregivers and more powerful peers. After the closure of the facilities, a lawsuit was launched, holding the government accountable for what happened under its watch. After the lawsuit, money was distributed as there were leftover funds. FIDA put in an application for funding to start a trauma clinic providing free of charge services to those who have been institutionalized in any way. The funding was for 18 months, and our service is being widely used. The clinic was designed to be fully accessible and to offer new and otherwise unavailable therapeutic options and choices for those seeking services. And that is how our Trauma to Trust Clinic came to be. So we're going to talk a bit about trauma and the trauma that I experienced by people with intellectual disabilities. Individuals with intellectual disabilities are at a higher risk for instances of trauma due to many uh, different factors. There is learned compliance from all the systems and institutions they are involved in. There is exposure to multiple caregivers providing assistance with personal care and how many people get to see or touch them when they're living in resources to support abuse, um, and they're not often heard or believed when they're making reports. Lack of education regarding rights, abuse, sexuality, and relationships. Poverty and isolation may make them vulnerable to rights and problems as well. And things can happen like they get involved with someone who's, for example, going to hide drugs in their apartment because it's a favor to a friend. Their increased risk of exposure to recurring events, such as repeated bullying or repeated abuse in the systems. <coughs> There's a lack of recognition often and of trauma in people with intellectual disabilities. Trauma and symptoms can be misunderstood as just behavior or attributed to the intellectual disability. Medications can sometimes mask the expressions of trauma. Um, there may be very few caregivers who value and understand. In some cases, no one abused or traumatic experiences are being dismissed as having happened too long ago to have had an impact on the individual, or individuals are viewed as to not have the same capacity for trauma, as we talked about before, as others do to the intellectual disability. When trauma goes unrecognized, often there's a lot of medications prescribed, vague or unclear diagnoses. is recognized, there's still challenges. The current understanding of trauma and mental health field does not encompass the multiple and chronic abuse experiences of people with intellectual disabilities. 
responsibilities. There's lack of professionals trained and willing to assess trauma and support trauma processing for people with intellectual disabilities. There's limited understanding of how to adapt therapeutic treatment approaches uh, for those who do not use traditional communication methods or who manifest trauma and symptoms differently to the typical trauma survivor. Treatment often consists mostly of efforts to manage symptoms and control behavior through medication and support plans. Historically, therapy options have been limited and inaccessible. Behavior therapy is often the only option. So we're now going to break down the different It provides a means to express those thoughts and feelings which are difficult to express in words, as I said. For a person with intellectual disabilities, it's often traumatic feelings have never been acknowledged. Through the art, they can become real again, and they can be acknowledged and memorialized. A broad range of feelings can be expressed safely in the art, to save space, and through the relationship, but often things can be expressed in the art that they don't even need to say out loud. They can put on a piece of paper, and it kind of moves it a little bit, and makes it a little bit safer. And it's physical. Um, 
share some art made by some people I've worked with in art therapy at Vita. Um, I have permission to show you the work, and I've changed the whole piece of talking to identifying factors or uh, anything identifying the tools. And there's no one who's on earth. Okay, so this is an individual who's pretty new in the funny. She's had a lot of trauma in her an individual who I worked with a while ago. He grew up in an institution. Um, he went there when he was really young and he actually stayed in the institution until they shut down. And when he when they, they were shut down, he moved into a different home in the community. He had a difficult time expressing his feelings, a difficult time expressing them verbally, he would become quite Childhood trauma, abusive relationships, and made a lot of art about protection. Always protecting himself from the artwork. Someone warriors. I just wanted to give you a little kind of view as to the variety of things done in art therapy. Um, there's people who have art with artwork sculpturally or whatever materials are available. I want to ask everyone here, who in this room is familiar with or have heard of expressive art therapy? Can you please raise your hand? Nice to know. Nice to know. Expressive art therapy for the individuals and the people here that don't know much about it. Expressive art therapy is a resource oriented and solution focused art space approach to psychotherapy. It uses the creative process of art making to improve and enhance the physical, mental, and emotional well being of all individuals. Through crystallization, the creative process involved in artistic self expression help people resolve conflicts and problems. It can help them develop interpersonal skills, manage behavior, reduce stress, increase self-esteem, self-awareness, and also can help with achieving insight. The arts are used intermodally in conjunction with talk therapy to treat psychological, emotional, and behavioral challenges. Some of the artistic modalities that I use within our clinic include music, visual art, poetry, movement, and theater. I'd like to share with you all four principles and practices of expressive art therapy. There are many more, and if you're interested in learning, you can please contact us or do your research. So the first point that I want to share with you is low skill, high sensitivity. Now let's go back in the beginning. Remember when I came up I started clapping, and you all clapped together? Yeah? Well, I mean, this is a little time for you to explain a little bit about that process. 
When this population is true of engaging, that clapping can be seen as a relatively low skill act. But when we clap together, did you hear the resonance of that clap? The words of togetherness, that synchronicity? For me, that was experienced as high sensitivity. That really speaks to the sensibility in offering art materials so that it, it offers a feeling of success. Because working with new and even sometimes familiar objects and materials, a feeling of success is important for us to want to continue to do it. This approach makes the arts more accessible and actually enjoyable. Second point is solution focused. Typically focusing on the present and future, focusing only on the past to the degree necessary for communicating empathy and accurate understanding of the individual concern. Three, resource oriented emphasizes the development and stimulation of an individual's strengths and resources rather than the reduction of symptoms or cure to pathology. Thus, the focus of therapy is positive experiences and coping rather than on difficult emotions, psychological conflicts, and problems. To clarify, this does not mean that individuals who have experienced trauma and who have a story to tell cannot speak about the past. Rather, let's look at this practice as an act and a reminder that each one of us has resilience within ourselves. Expressive art therapy is implicitly empowerment based. Unconditional positive regard and validation increases the degree of autonomy and self determination in individuals in order to enable them to represent their interests in a responsible and self determined way, acting on their own authority. Putting power back into the person who feels powerless. It is a process of becoming stronger and more confident, especially in controlling one's life and claiming one's rights. Empowerment as action refers to both as the process of self empowerment and to professional support of people, which enables them to overcome their sense of powerlessness and lack of influence and to recognize and to use their resources. Why expressive art therapy? Well, sometimes it's difficult or impossible to express feelings with just words. Emotion, particularly those that result from trauma, can be difficult to articulate. And oftentimes, words just don't simply convey the meaning. Because feelings are difficult to relate with words, many people push them inward. And this causes depression, confusion, anxiousness, hopelessness, Frustration, the list goes on. Sound familiar? Well, it is, it is in our planet for sure. So, the art making process can be particularly beneficial in circumstances where complex emotions need to be addressed. And more often than not, it seems to be the case with individuals who have experienced trauma. The arts can be seen as an additional faculty of expression, particularly to non traditional communicators that do not express themselves through spoken the art making process can help people confront emotions, they can overcome depression, they can integrate their traumatic experiences and find relief and resolution in grief and loss. Expressive art therapy takes an intermodal approach with the arts by providing a space which allows an individual to follow their attractor. Following one's attractor. Well, maybe another way to look at this term is following one's has everyone here, have you heard that before when people tell you follow your instincts? Yeah, can I see it? Raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. So, one may start off in the clinical space by following their chapters, for example, by writing a story. And then the story may have actions and movement to deepen the essence of the storyline. And most of us do this, even while we're speaking. Me standing in front of you, I'm using my hand gestures to really further express my trying to say. And at that point, if the individual would like to deepen that experience a little bit more, they might want to add a little bit of music, with some instruments, a little bit of sound to make the story a little bit richer. Taking an intermodal approach is really what makes expressive art therapy unique in the domain of the arts and psychology. Carl Young said, of something new is not accomplished by the intellect, the 
by the play instinct acting from the inner necessity. The creative mind plays with the object of love. What's really captured my attention with this quote is the term inner necessity. Some of us in this room may be familiar and understand what our inner necessities are. And some of us, we may not have that. So expressive art therapy can help us discover By using the imagination, you can look at a cloud and see an emerging figure. Maybe you can stare at an empty canvas and see some colors emerging. Or maybe you can be sitting in silence and hear that song happening without physically having it there. Now, I want to ask any of you, can you please raise your hand if you've experienced any of the aforementioned quotes that I just said with the imagination? Well, imagination is the ability to shape and reshape ideas and sensations in the mind without any immediate input from other senses. Imagination can help make knowledge applicable in solving problems and is fundamental in integrating experiences in the learning process. By working with the imagination, individuals create new experiences for themselves, which open up to new doors, to new awarenesses, and provide new avenues New sometimes means a person does not need to feel that they have artistic ability to use or benefit from expressive art therapy. Each person has within themselves creative tools and resources to address their struggles and gain insight. Working with the imagination allows individuals to engage playfully and creatively, ultimately enhancing their quality of life. As a clinician, and a person who has lived experience with trauma, I understand the feeling of stuckness and hopelessness. For many people, including myself, circular thoughts start occurring and choices just feel limited. The imagination helps expand the play range of an individual by offering low risk choices. This can be choosing or not choosing which color to use. This can be having a choice and voice by stating which instrument they like or they don't like. This act of choosing and deciding may be transferred and integrated from the clinical space into the person's everyday life. The act of expanding one's play range may contribute to the individual's trust to make decisions for themselves. Remember what I mentioned, empowering faith? Imaginary Friends Project. Very excited to share this with you all. I had, um, with permission and blessings, I am happy to present to you the Imaginary Friends Project. And this is created by an individual named Zach. He is a 21 year old artist, gamer, and photographer. Now, on a side note, I feel it's important for me to share that Zach was really excited to share this work and is happy. Um, share his name and some of his interests, and I'll be sharing some quotes um, by him a little bit later on. <coughs> he is a member that I've been seeing at the clinic who has experienced numerous traumas. <coughs> Zach enjoys digital art and photography to capture his moments of joy. He says that through the Imaginary Friends Project, he's able to create fictional characters to keep him company. Zach uses storytelling and digital art to express his feelings, experiences, and fantasies. Recently, Zach created a series of IF photos titled The Aftermath. He shares that the aftermath explores change and transformation. Prior to coming into a therapeutic relationship with me, Zach has created the IF project on his own. And we use this modality to further explore the themes that came up in therapy. By welcoming him to continue using the modality that he most resonated with, demonstrates a client-centered and resource-oriented approach. The following next two slides are from the Aftermath series. This piece 
is titled Sharing. and then I draw it out. And boom! I executed my plan. And that's exactly how he said it. Boom! I executed my plan. From what Zach shared, I'm glad to know that he is aware of his resources and is executing and exercising his ability to take uh, to carry through a plan creatively. And if I lit up when he shared this series that he created with me, the gift, the gift it is to me. doing this type of work with the individuals we support. It's fairly new, um, and, and I'm glad to be a part of that. Um, so I just want to review quickly a little bit what psychotherapy is in terms of how I use psychotherapy. So it's the use of psychological theories and practices to help a person explore behavior, mood, um, cognitive processes, and experience. Um, it uses such practices to explore and overcome problems. All over uh, overall well being and mental health. So we explore and resolve and mitigate behaviors, beliefs, compulsions, thoughts, and emotions. Uh, support in the development of social and interpersonal skills and new services of it. Now, uh, like here, these evidence based theories and practices can be used for treating some diagnosis and disorders. There are over a thousand different some um, being minor variations, while others are based on very different conceptions of psychology and ethics. I believe Dania um, mentioned that already today. Um, I actually, from doing this research, I knew there were several types of psychotherapies. I didn't know what type of houses. Um, so I think we, we've got to be mindful. Um, I believe one of the peer mentors had spoke about finding a good therapist Somebody that listens, somebody that will, will, will be with you, support you, um, because we can very easily go to somebody uh, who is not supporting our own will or our own beliefs. Um, and, and you know, there's a risk with therapy, right? There, there's a risk of harm, and our job really is to do no more harm. Um, and I think that's very important as therapists uh, and education and educators. Psychotherapy techniques are typically mental. Uh,
So we need a collaborative approach, a collaborative approach in techniques, systems, um, networks of people. Um, and so, so this is sort of where that trend can get to my So the modes of psychotherapy I primarily use so psychodynamic and insight oriented therapy, uh, cognitive behavior therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, mindfulness, and narrative therapy. Um, 100% through our clinic have suffered some sort of traumatic experience or continuing like currently experiencing some sort of trauma. Um, so why is that therapy? So it creates a safe space for individuals to share their experience, thoughts, and feelings. Often the individuals we've supported, uh, I worked at Vita for 10 years.
dragon and the god? A, a door, like a dog, a door. A
I was thinking, what is touche? Instead of like focusing on my work, right? So I'm like, what did she say again? Like I was thinking about myself, <laughs> and myself and this organizing. Like I can't, like, cause I'm so like thinking in my mind that I focus on my people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Anybody else? So I'm a mom and I can um, tune out a lot. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, just being aware, not only the distraction, but just that there's other people here doing it too. So just sort of looking to see what they're doing as well. So um, I couldn't tune you out. Um, but uh, it, is, it is difficult because I find it, especially in writing, so as I'm writing, I'm saying something over there, I'm writing what they're saying. So it does distract, absolutely. Um, I'll add, like, I was trying really hard to tune you guys out and just focus on what I was doing, but I felt bad when you were asking me questions and, and trying to engage me, and I was just ignoring you, and I felt really badly about that. <laughs> I felt guilty for not responding. <laughs> well, I can be a rebel sometimes. <laughs> well, and, and I think that points to a greater issue, too, which is that guilt. I felt distracted uh, as I was trying to do my work. Uh, I knew the task, uh, but I felt guilty for not attending. Um, so I think that was a really nice reflection, too, that we can all relate to a little bit. Yeah. And where sort of our intentions are as helpers, right? Well, I felt guilty um, to focus on my job, kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, for the, let's try this again. <laughs> Now, I usually uh, do it silent, so maybe we'll do that, or, or, or would you prefer to have some spa music on? So it, it's still music. I normally do the activity without any music. Unless you're out here Sorry, whatever. Maybe after. <laughs> How can we do it without the music? Because that's the way I normally do it, okay? Uh, so mix up all your smarties again. was one minute and three seconds guys so we we see a big difference yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and you know I, I want to bring up one quick point that one time somebody had mentioned but you know what sometimes music does help me concentrate and that's okay right so 
we would we would support that. Um, but for this activity is just the point of looking at mindfulness, being in the here and now with no distractions, not paying attention to me, you know, Virginia, somebody asking me for some more smart aids, but rather just focusing in the here and now on the task. Um, but by all means, it does not mean that others can't use some of these tools and still be able to concentrate, if that makes sense. Okay. Especially if it's a song that you like. Like if, it's, if it's a song that you've chosen, right. you can relax to it, even if it's a heavy song. Right. But if it's somebody else's music that you may not like, that's distracting. Well, there you yeah. go. There's yeah. another one. I like the song, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great point. That is a great song. I've never heard it before about adding it to my playlist. You're welcome. Sure. Thank you. Um, yes, so let's share the experience now with no distractions. And I'm sorry, I'm behind you guys here. I got kind of carried away with the different like designs and the feel of the Smarties and the sound it makes along the table. I was able to appreciate that because it was quite. So you're sort of also speaking to your five senses. So incorporating the five senses into the activity. The desire to be more creative. Like you can be more creative when you're not distracted. Thank you very much for participating. Can I take a picture of the, of the table first? Yeah, I know that's odd, eh? But I'm going for it. Uh, um, you know what comes from this all the time is uh, this beautiful, I, I don't even really know how to describe it, but it happens all the time. And it's, and it's, it's mostly, I, I do a mindfulness called Leaves on the Stream as well. Do you guys mind if you're in the picture, or? Okay. Sure, I'm sorry, is this okay? <laughs> Just so that I can ask you guys, perfect. Uh, so the art that sort of had come out of this table, when I also do what's called leaves on the stream, I'll do the mindfulness meditation, and then for a whole half an hour or so, we're talking about, well, what color were your leaves on the stream? Because the, the whole mind, mindfulness meditation is, sitting by the stream, you know, you see leaves going along the stream, and you know, place that thought on the leaf and let it flow down. And so after the meditation, it's really interesting to see what are the relational pieces? What color were your leaves? How fast was your stream going? Um, was it going fast? Was, were there waves? Um, and I feel there's so much connection um, and meaningful connection that can happen after those conversations. Thank you, everybody. Please take your Smarties with you. <laughs> and maybe we can give them some support. Thank you. Some folks are putting away their Smarties and their goodies. I hope someone's willing to share one piece of Smarties with you, please. <laughs> So now, our team, we'd like to open up um, to some comments and some questions. If anybody has any uh, I have a question. Uh, my name is Leo. I'm a social um, So given people with IT and developmental disabilities have different functional abilities, and cognitively near the spectrum. Um, how do you decide on which modality would be art, express art, psychotherapy? How do you decide on which which modality to use? Is it in collaboration or is it exclusive? Can I start? Sure. So um, currently actually with our, our clinic when some when a referral comes in we do um, have choices uh, and people click off the choices so individual group what they're interested in so sometimes it'll just say they'll just have clicked psychotherapy or they'll just have clicked art or checked off art therapy or sometimes we get people come in where it says all three and so far we've 
like the individual therapist has reached out and, and we start with the modality that they've chosen. Um, but from that, I know that we've, there's been discussion between therapists where, you know, I think maybe it might be useful to use some of your techniques with this individual. Um, could we try out something? And um, we also have uh, some groups that happen too. So there is a studio group that runs right now, which is an arts-based group drop-in. So if someone has just chosen one of the things, they can then come to the group and, and get an experience of how the things that are happening. That's your question? I think that's a really great question, if I could just add to that, that we do exercise flexibility. So if a member comes in and they're like, listen, I want to try art therapy and it doesn't work well with them, they have the option of checking out the other um, the other services that we provide. I also want to just make a note, because you just said member. So we use the term member at VENA Community Living Services. It was chosen by the people that we support. So if you hear us say member, we mean the individuals that we're working with. They said they're using that's the language that they chose. Uh, and if I could just add a quick note to that, you know, um, so recently um, I had a gentleman come in who has autism um, and he doesn't present very much verbal language communication. Other than, yes, sorry, other than it's fine, right? That's what he said a lot of. So um, English was the second language, but the referral was for me. Um, so how that came about was just that it was a lot of rapport building, using some of the worksheets to get through the mood, but he still wanted to talk somehow. So I, I kind of feel, well, am I, is this doing justice? So what we're doing now is sort of collaborating. So I, he'll see me once a week, and we're transitioning him <laughs> to an, a, um, an expressive arts group to start to sort of meet Virginia and work up a social network. Uh, this gentleman had significant trauma. He went to university, um, a lot of abuse there, so even meeting new people was difficult. He didn't like art, didn't want to touch anything, but I really felt that maybe you know, he could benefit from it. So right now we're currently coordinating that, but it's always just within us three trying to figure out those things. And often we'll get a referral and it is a person who doesn't communicate traditionally, so automatically it goes to our therapy or expressive arts therapy, and we just start and try and see if it's going to work for the person and if they're even interested in it. So there's always flexibility there as well. Hi, my name is Maria, and I'm at the VIDA agency, and they got me involved with Amanda, and when Amanda was showing, the art picture, it brought me back memories that when I was in her art class and and I was doing when, when I was when Amanda was showing some art pictures, it reminded me in the past that the the way she was doing with me and I wanna thank her for all her support and thank Vita because if it wouldn't be for her I wouldn't be there, you know, doing art therapy. So thank you. Thank you, Maria. You're welcome. I think I can project. Okay. Um, you may have already answered my question, so forgive me if you have. But how do you define trauma for your clinic? Does it have to be verified, or can it just be a subjective experience? Jump in. So originally, the money comes from when the institution's closed, and that money was for survivors from institutions. But we also said that we were going to, uh, we wanted to provide therapy for trauma. So we kind of just said, across the board, trauma. Like, we ask people from institutions that they will be first served, but everyone who comes to us has trauma, and we don't ask for proof of trauma. You, we get people come, and they're like, we've been we can't find a therapist anywhere, and are really you're free? And I, what? Can we come? When can we start? So we get immediately calls, and um, so yeah, we haven't. It would be really difficult to get someone to define their trauma for us. I mean, we know everyone's coming with trauma, and I, once we start with people, we get information. Yeah. But really, we don't. No one's disqualified. People want therapy; they get therapy. And um, 
one big thing with the clinic is we do do an assessment piece, but it's not that, um, it, first of all, it can be creative. So it can be talking to person, it can be on our official intake assessment. We really work outside the box. Um, often the assessment piece alone further re-traumatizes people or they've had so many bad experiences with filling out papers. Like We've heard that so much. So we try to kind of get away, get the information, um, but only what we need. Like, do I need to know absolutely anything, everything on paper or, or can we share that story in the session? Um, that doesn't go to say that a lot of the people are diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, but it's just not. Melody, I just wanted to ask um, two individuals that I uh, support. Um, this makes a lot of sense. However, neither one of those individuals would be able to go somewhere. Um, and one wouldn't have access to a computer. Um, both, I think, would benefit from actually anyone. Um, and, I, and one I know for sure, for example, loves art. Um, is there a mobile aspect yet in the future? Maybe. <laughs> um, not at this time, mobile in terms of us coming. Vita does offer, uh, Vita, so our, our clinical team is not only our, us, right? it includes behavior therapists. Lots of them will do home visits, but that's included in the service. Uh, because it's a funded 18 months, we haven't been approved to do those types of things. We've been very transparent, um, but we do online, we do telephone. Um, yes. Now sometimes, I mean, depending, I think it goes very individual. Uh, we, we, I like to meet people. Uh, I work really hard and creative to, to push with my boss. Can I just make that one visit? Um, so we try everything that we can. Uh, we've also reached out to partners or people that we are hoping to partner with us in the far east, the far west, and the far north, so that we have free office space um, just to have people access the service in different areas because we can't be going to them. Uh, everybody's giving the space for free, which has been amazing. I don't have the list of names here, uh, but if anybody wants that information, I can definitely give to them. question is related to the expressive arts therapy and art therapy and also tying in with what you said about leaves on the river. Um, I know people who do expressive arts therapy and uh, art therapy and I think it's wonderful. My question though is that when you're, when you're using colors and imagery and you're making some interpretations based on that or, or just get it, gathering some information, how is it done? Because different colors can represent different things for different people. Uh, and culturally, some colors can have totally opposite meanings. So how do we put that together? Right? Just to have some insight on that. That is a great question. For under expressive arts therapy in our practice, interpreting and creating meaning from artwork that's not created by the self, we call that image of interpreting. Allowing the individual to find their own metaphors and their own meanings for it is an ethical approach, I believe, to the work that we do. As you've mentioned, different cultures, different individuals living in different circumstances will have different symbols and metaphors that they're trying to, res uh, that they're trying to communicate. And for us, um, and particularly in, within the, the clinical setting, we're very much aware of that dynamic. And in the space, in the clinical space for myself, I make sure that the space is given for the individual to name and to define their own artwork. But I was just gonna say for art therapy, it's exactly the same. It's not for me to interpret, it's for the individual to interpret the work and the symbols and the color type of thing. Yeah, and on the leaves of the stream, when I said, uh, it's more of an exploration. Right. So it's interesting, yellow, purple leaves. 
And in my brain, I would just see sort of a green and a red leaf, right? So it's just about conversation base and more of an interrelationship, building a relationship, building a rapport. Is there a weakness? Excuse me, sir. I'm just going to start. Thank you. There's an order to this uh, question. Um, I just wanted to know if there's any work that you do with caregivers. So if I'm working with an individual, often the majority of my clients are still living with their caregivers. Um, I don't know if you spoke to that. Like, is there a component where a, a mother and, and her son can come and do some joint work together? At this point, we're not doing anything like that. That's the major. What could I add to that? Our drop-in program that happens every Monday, 1 to 3 p.m., um, is actually welcoming of all individuals and their caregivers to come in so that there could be a co-created art space and maybe a different relationship that can be experienced within the individual and their support staff. Because we find value in that, that there's relationships sometimes beyond just our work roles. And in the studio space, we cultivate that relationship and we encourage it by welcoming family and friends of that individual to join in the art making process. And yes, there is. Well, there isn't. We're, we're, there might be a wait list. We, we're constantly kind of in fluctuation. So because it just opened, we started in May. Um, there is, we're constantly taking in new people, there is some movement. So there's info sheets out back, or at the info table, there's also email us. Our info sheet has our main um, outreach person, so please send referrals if you have them. There might be a wait list, but that doesn't mean there's no movement in the wait list. So in, in uh, Sarah, you said therapeutic psychotherapy session format. I would, right now, we're not bringing in couples, families, we're getting a lot of requests for it, so I think you speak to big need. Um, but I will, if, if somebody's asking to bring somebody in um, for a very specific reason, yes, I will help facilitate that. It's not based, or not, it's not couples counselor, it's not family counseling. They've sort of worked out a plan, what they needed to say, or how they needed to do that, and, and that setting was also had caseworkers come in, but it's all based on informed consent. It has to be coming from that person. I've had families to calling me saying, well, I'm going to set up. I need to come to the session. And I'm like, well, no, you don't need to come to the session. Um, and, uh, but we navigate those mindfully validating families. We need to validate families. Families have gone so through so much as well, uh, so creating space for that. And I, I have a wait list right now. So it's about five, six people. But we're, we're trying to do the um, We're hoping to expand our services. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, so I just, just want to know, know where you guys are located. Good question. So we're in <laughs> Toronto, um, but uh, the, our the trauma distress clinic is located at uh, Weston and Steeles at our head office, and I also work at. In the 401. So we're Toronto based, but we're doing our best to serve other areas. Yeah. Jessica was saying. Thanks. Uh, so before you were talking about um, inner necessary, uh, inner necessity, well, the necessity? Yeah, like the PowerPoint. Um, can you expand on that and like, what activities they can do to like, express themselves? That's a great question, and I think that that's very client and situation specific. But for myself, I can imagine some things that have happened is through the artworks, messages, metaphors may come up, and they may speak to a need for the individual. And it, they, there's the moment, there's a moment in therapy sessions where there's aha moments, where things all of a sudden click. It just makes sense. And in those moments, I believe that those are parts of touching and getting in touch with our inner necessity. So it's very situation and client specific, that question, but I do appreciate it because I think this navigation and exploration in terms of what our inner necessities are, I'm still very curious about it. And I'm truly, that's what drives me in this work because I'm so curious about the stories of each individual and how they come into their stories or out of their stories. Um, so, yeah, so I have another question. Um, you, like, you know how you do um, artwork, poetry, painting? 
do we have to ex like explain why we draw the painting or that's a great question. I think it would certainly depend on the individual. If they would like to explain and they want to describe, they're welcome to do that. But they are not um, forced to do that. It's not a, they, that's not absolutely necessary within our sessions. But rather, what we do is we look at the process of the art making and we see what emerged, what challenges came up through that, or surprises. And then the individual is able to draw the connections and see. Do these things that came up through the art making process come into the everyday life? Could they apply maybe something that they've experienced within the process within their everyday life? So, thank you. Yeah. Can I see how many more questions we have? One. You can also email us with any questions. Hi, my name is Lydia, and I work at incorporate art into a lot of the um, training activities that we do, um, being mindful of the fact that a lot of the participants that I have have had negative experiences or trauma related to the education system or even other training programs or day programs. So um, my current participants really enjoy doing like arts and crafts activities. So my question is a bit more um, selfish, I guess, in terms of my program. And I'm wondering if you guys like have any um, ideas or tips that I can apply to my program or any other setting. So for example, um, we do a variety of different modules and one of them is like workplace etiquette. And one of the things we talk about is, um, you know, proper workplace attire, like the proper clothing to go to work. So I do an activity with them where um, I use paper dolls that have been pre-cut so that people with varying abilities can still participate and have a finished product that looks similar to that of their peers. So I will have like the dolls and they get to pick, you know, a gender or non-gender or whatever. And they get to, um, they have to pick a, like a profession or an application and then pick from a variety of pre-cut um, clothing items and accessories to, you know, create this um, person of a specific occupation or job. And then they put it together on a piece of paper and they've got like a variety of materials like, you know, crayons, pencil crayons. There's stickers, there's glitter, um, they can draw, they can write on it, that kind of thing. Um, to really personalize it, but at the end of the day, like I'm trying to get something structured out of it, and I'm trying to get them to demonstrate that they understand the proper, you know, work that's hire. So for example, if someone shows a business person, you know, it wouldn't be appropriate for them to pick a pair of shorts and flip-flops for their person. Same thing, similarly, if someone shows a veterinarian, you know, the veterinarian would have, like, I would be expecting the veterinarian, you know, composition to have, you know, scrubs and maybe cat and dog stickers on it. So that's the kind of thing I'm doing with them. So I'm wondering if you can um, give me any ideas or tips or, you know, any, like, feedback or insight on to, like, what other things I can do to incorporate art into activities that are more structured. Sounds like you're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this would be the kind of thing where it would be great if you emailed us. Okay. And we could like send you some references. Perfect. Books or yeah. ideas. Because I could stand here and like, some ideas, but it might be easier to do it that way. Okay, thank you. Does that work? It's really good to also note that most of the um, activities can be adapted or When the clinic came out, we have some pre-tests, we have some post-tests. We use uh, a 
a session rating scale, an outcome rating scale. I, I use the BDI, BDA. So as people are coming into therapy, we'll do a series of battery of assessments. Sometimes that takes two to three months though. So we want, you know, BDI for one person could take four sessions. Um, we have a trauma inventory as well because it's trauma focused. So there's about five or six tools that we're using interchangeably. Hopefully we can create one um, also for um, um, sort of the language right now. But we're also looking at hopefully creating something that suits the needs of the individuals that have a lower functioning abilities. So those who don't communicate verbally, um, how are their voices heard, sort of? How, how does their feedback get to us? Because we want that. We're definitely thinking about it. Our director will be speaking to the ministry, I think, soon. Uh, and, but they haven't requested for any data. We've just been trying to do that all. <coughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, Jordan, thanking uh, Jessica and Amanda.